Namu tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namu tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namu tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sangham namasami So I haven't been sitting on this chair for quite a long time, so... It's a <clears throat> strange experience to be back up here, overseeing you in the distance, everybody. So I feel affected by that, personally. And people are behind me. <laughs> and Ajahn Amaru has invited me to give a reflection tonight. So... <clears throat> I see what will come. I haven't planned anything. Even though I haven't planned anything, it doesn't mean I haven't actually had some thoughts and some kind of um, um, certain amount of things coming through my consciousness as, as to what to maybe have speak about or address or reflect upon. <clears throat> yeah, it takes a little bit of time for me just to kind of realize what a different community I'm part of. It's so different. It's, uh, it's not that the Dhamma is different or the path is different or Buddhism <laughs> is the same teaching. But the community of nuns in particular have really changed. You know, quite a few nuns have gone, quite a few nuns have ordained new. And um, I think for the on the monk side, it's more stabilized, <clears throat> even though there are some new members already, um, ordained as uh, an agarika. So I'm sure I have, like me, probably. Many of you have appreciated having a time to dedicate oneself to the Dhamma, to the practice, to meditation, and just to be able to have the, the good fortune, the, the privilege, I would say, to drop all, <clears throat> all, all things that tie us up with worldly matters, worldly concerns, worldly business. So this is just finished a retreat time. It wasn't very long, just a week. But you can see the, you know, this great privilege we have in this life to be able to drop completely all worldly matters. <laughs> Even though I know some people have worked during that time, not because they wanted to work, but because of a certain amount of necessary things to attend. But nevertheless, we were left with a very, a, a sense of stopping and attending another aspect of our life. I myself also live a different life. I'm much more retired from the <coughs> community of nuns. 
Um, I'm kind of um, living more on my own, having time to spend, I can spend a lot of time on my own, which I really enjoy. And I can also see the non community growing little by little, more people continue to come and go. So certainly there's a lot of nuns in brown and novices in white who have come to join the community at different stages of their life. And so <clears throat> this is make me reflect on the good fortune we have to um, be able to stay in a place that offers um, all the right conditions to f really cultivate the Buddhist path. And not only that, but also where uh, uh, a training is offered, a training for the mind, training for the body is offered to each one of us. Whether you started 40 years ago like me or you started yesterday, the training carries on. It's life. It's your life is a, your training. It doesn't stop till the last breath. Even though sometimes people imagine that because you've been in this life for a long time, somehow <laughs> you can dispense with the training. No way. Life never lets you down in terms of challenges, difficulties, um, um, conflicts, things that are, need a, a lot of attention and, and, and uh, discipline to not get uh, confused or stuck with this kind of um, challenges. So the work goes on and it is a beautiful work, an extraordinary work because it's very clearly, without any doubt, you can realize how much the past really frees it frees the heart, it frees the mind, it frees this human being one, uh, one is. It really uh, works, in other words. It's not just a, a, you know, any, <clears throat> something that we hope will work one day or an ideal that will manifest one day or a, a hope, whatever. A, hoping that we will f be free one day. If one practice correctly, you can see that the freedom can be seen moment by moment. And maybe that's one of the great um, gift of the Buddhist teaching, is that you don't have to think about how things should be. It's not the past. The past is not thinking about how the things should be is to know things as they are, here and now, in this very moment. So it's a particular training of the mind. It's not a training we find very often in this world. To be able to be attentive to the experience of each moment, because that's when you begin to deepen your understanding of what a human being is about. It's not something terribly mysterious. You just, what you do in, in the present moment is that you have a chance to um, really uh, dive into the knowledge of what the Buddha calls the five khandhas, which is the body, the feelings, the, the perception, the mental formations or thoughts, activity. Uh, and then the last, um, you know, the last one being the um, sense consciousness. So this as five aspect of our of our life is rarely talked about. Whether you are studying as a little boy, little girl, uh, a, later on as primary school, secondary school, university, you know, and PhD, all kind, very rarely you are taught 
to pay attention to those five khandhas. And yet, they are part of us. We live with them all day long, all night long, for sometimes many, many years. So the Buddha has enabled us to really um, make use of these five khandhas to understand what we are, who we are, to understand the path of freedom, to understand the, the, you could say, the liberation of the mind. So this is a, a great gift that is offered to mankind, to humans. I don't know about the cats and the dogs, but <laughs> I'm sure they, they benefit from the peace that they receive from the people practicing. I can see that. We have three cats here, and they're always very happy to see you and to be cuddled with a peaceful heart. <laughs> and a kind mind. So this is um, perhaps quite important to, to remind oneself that the past itself is not, as I said earlier, thinking about what it is, or you can think about, of course, what it is. You, you have a, your freedom, you can do what you want with yourself, but it's not having an idea about how things should be, even though people may think like that, you know. It's like yeah, having an idea is almost enough, you know, people may be content with just knowing what it should be or what you think it should be or what you imagine the past is, you know. The past is, is, is not something you, you think about. Thinking, remember, is one of the five khandhas. But the past itself is what brings those five khandhas together to enable to have all the information you need to discover the path, you know, all the informations. By this is that you're not just in the dark, you're not just imagining something, you just, you, you really begin to understand that you're living in a particular world. And this particular world is brought under the light of our attention, our mindfulness, our consciousness. So, not only you begin to see things more clearly, but also you begin to, things, to see things as they are, not as you imagine them to be, but as they are. And things are changing constantly. It's not like things are static and stay in one place or remain the same. They're constantly changing. So this is really a new view of life, isn't it? To have this clear vision of the constant changeliness, changingness of the mind, body, ourselves, physically, mentally, emotionally, and um, psychologically, and, and you know. So you, you begin to see how you're living in a very changing universe, you know, even though ourself are so used to um, you know, there is a very strong habit in us that we, that feels very comfortable for a long time is that we wish things would not change. Especially when they are nice, pleasant, and we love them very much. We don't, we would rather not have them change. So what happens is we cling to things and sometimes that's the doorway to bring us to Dhamma because we realize just through the experience of clinging to things that we like, and things that we like is like everything else. It's moving on, it's changing, it's moving on. As the Buddha calls it, it's anicca or impermanent. So this is a new vision of ourselves. For a long, long time, I never thought, seen, I could see that many things were impermanent, but I never called it impermanent. I just, I didn't have a name for it. It was just something I didn't notice. 
you know? The years go by from 10 to 12 to 15 to 20. Things change constantly, but you don't notice so deeply as you do these five candles until you really um, pay attention and become deeply conscious of how it functions. Now, not only do the Buddhist teaching <clears throat> is pointing to this whole nature of phenomena as being impermanent, changing, moving on, etc., you know, ephemeral, whatever adjective you want to find, but it's definitely moving on. But it's also, um, I think that's an aspect that most well known of the Buddhist teaching is that there is suffering and there is an end of suffering. That's what the Buddha says in one of his teaching where he says, I teach two things, suffering and the end of suffering. So this aspect of suffering is one of the quality of phenomena, the impermanence and then suffering or suffering impermanence, we can put it in different, and, you know, you don't have to have a way, a certain way to define them or, but definitely uh, I think once you <clears throat> begin to hear the word uh, suffering, you begin dukkha in Pali, suddenly a whole world opens up to us because maybe we have suffered for a long, long time, but we didn't have a name for it. We didn't have a way of understanding it. We, we felt very personally a, a kind of um, attacked sometime by the suffering, or we felt bad, we, we added all kind of interpretation related to this suffering. And most of the time it was like, I'm a failure, I'm a bad person, they are failures, they are a bad person. This suffering can, you know, is interpreted for a long, long time in a very deluded way, in a very uh, you know, wrong way, I would say. You know, it's not clear, we don't understand it. So dukkha, like impermanence, is part of those characteristics of all phenomena the Buddha talk says. You know, it's not just me, but all phenomena in the universe share these particular characteristics. So that definitely brings us quite close to the universe. You could say we well, don't feel so, so alone anymore. We, oh, everybody in this universe have those, shares those qualities. I mean, there's three. There's Dukkha, there is uh, Anicca, and there is the, the third one, most famous and most difficult for, to understand or to get to really see deeply what it means. Everything is not self, and not self, in this case, you can use other words like things do not belong to me. They don't belong to me. They are not mine. They are not me, and they are not mine. And so that is uh, difficult for all of us to come to terms with that, you know. Imagine that the body is not me, not mine, my eyes, my ears, my nose, my everything, my thoughts, my feeling, my philosophy, my birth, it's not mine. <laughs> you have to be, you know, I've just been sort of uh, uh, editing an article that I was working on and I say, you know, before you get into this aspect of it's not me, not mine, not belonging to me, not self, you have to have some kind of understanding of what suffering is about. Because the mind can easily say, oh my God, you know, not me, not mine, who am I? You can start feeling quite depressed. You know, nothing is yours, doesn't belong to you. It's, you know, um, so what, what, what am I? Who am I? And there may be a sense of void, something void, empty, you know, not mean or mine, not self. Because for a long, long time, I see, I consider, I 
uh, experience myself as a very strong, relatively permanent personality. Yes, I, I don't see for many years, I never saw myself as somebody who was changing all the time. And the, the whole, my whole life doesn't belong to me. <laughs> that was my life, not the neighbor's life. And it suddenly was me, <laughs> nobody else. So this is not so easy to really um, come to term even, just to understand what this non-self is about. But as many famous good teacher, practitioner, we, which we could, ourselves could, um, you know, discover very easily. Um, one of the most important thing is that the fact that we are, there is this quality of impermanence. This is a beginning, you could say. Because as you see this quality of impermanence, this characteristic, then you begin to maybe question, you know, oh, if that is impermanent, maybe this self is also impermanent. This doesn't belong to me. It's not me. So you begin to enter a, a universe which is very fluid. When most of the time we tend to think, we tend to um, imagine, we tend to interpret, we tend to, um, you know, um, how can I say, we perceive things in a very solid way. Whether we perceive people, we perceive life, we perceive uh, experiences, etc. It often has a quality of solidity. You know, we don't imagine that thing could be moving very quickly. I mean, if if you just think about the fact that any one of us can die any time, and I'm not saying this because I'm 75 now, but I was already thinking about this when I was, you know, in my late 20s, 30 because of a, a particular experience, not at me who died, but um, some, uh, somebody, some another person died, not even close to me, but that really gave me a shock, how we could die any time. And that kind of realization brought to me the fact that things are truly impermanent. <laughs> you don't have to think too much about it, you know, truly. You never know when somebody very young, very old, very, you know, you could, your life could be cut off. And so that, for me, that, that aspect of death has been the, the, one of the biggest teachers all through my life as a nun. Because from the age of 28, 29, when I had this experience that we could really snap out, <laughs> snapped off life any time. Um, you know, it, it was always this, this element of dying and death became an incredible kind of a, um, means of being awake and being mindful, you know. There was such a kind of a force behind my life that always reminded me, be careful. You might not have, you don't know how long you live. Be careful, be mindful. It doesn't mean you get things right or you do things perfectly. That has nothing to do with that. But always I was like on the alert, on the mindfulness will come with this remembering that we can die any time. So um, you can see how this teaching is incredibly, in a way, it's like a huge field on investigation. It's like being a bit, almost like being like a scientist, you know, of life, you could say, where you start exploring all this aspect of, our, of your life that maybe you never really touched on as you were uh, not so um, knowledgeable with the Buddhist teaching. So there is many, many things I could tell you about, you know, but um, one has to be careful with the time. I'm not very good at keeping time myself. I have to continue training. 
quite a lot <laughs> to not get over the time. Get, when I get interested in something, <laughs> it's very easy for me to get lost <laughs> to it. But <clears throat> so even though we have this aspect of our life, the five kandas, all the characteristics that these kandas possess, we still live a normal life. We still live with human beings, which are terribly imperfect. I include myself, of course. You know, we're all here because we have suffered. We're all here because we have really had to find what we're looking for. You know, even, you know, how many people have had incredibly successful life, incredibly successful, uh, you know, uh, academically very successful uh, in terms of uh, power and money, very successful. Still, we all know that even if you haven't been so successful, so rich, or so academically, uh, you know, genius, an academic level, you still know that something is missing. Not what may, brings people to Amaravati. I think many of us have known that many rich people are still miserable, many beautiful people, attractive people are still miserable, who never find themselves good enough, never find themselves interesting enough, or maybe attractive enough. So you can see there is a dissatisfaction in us which is not dependent on external things necessarily. It's, um, there's something that is yearning for, in a way, for something we don't know for a long, long time. There's a kind of yearning. And we call it, you know, I'm suffering. Uh, it's not like you're suffering necessarily, but you're, there is, a, a, you know, a, an element of life which is absolutely vital, most important, and actually the most important things of our life is still we haven't we're not conscious yet fully you know we come before we come to Amalawati we're not fully conscious and that lack of consciousness is knocking at your door and saying hey wake up wake up wake up don't miss your chance and long, for a long long time I remember when I was 20 I was totally worldly and totally uh, into my, my life as a worldly woman. And I remember a voice came to my mind, and out of the blue, it said, look how far you have gone from your nature. Now, all these words were really kind of bizarre to me. Nature, what's that, you know? <laughs> oh, gone far away. I had no idea what, what it was. But there was a sense, and a, a, a kind of realization look how far you've gone from your nature. I was like 19, 20. And I was just in the countryside behind my, my parents' house. And I was on my own. And uh, it was very quiet. And I remember that. And it struck me. Something struck me. So much struck. I never liked to write little notes and little poems. I was not the type writing a lot of anything. But that particular sentence, I wrote it down as a, I wanted to remember it. And um, I, I learned about it later on when I met Buddhism, you know. That's about 10 years later, 10, 11 years later, when you realize that your nature is your, you, the Dharma in you. You know, that's the Dharma, that's the Dharma realm in you. And uh, that's what I was, I was being told in a way, that little message, look how far you've gone from your nature. So, um, it takes a while to realize uh, such a truth. You know, you don't know what the, what the universe is talking about when it tells you this. You know, it's just like a little message from God knows where. I had no idea. But suddenly, in my mind, it went to my mind. And so, <clears throat> being just an ordinary human being like all of us, you know, here, we have a, a quite a, you know, it's a, it's a work which is very interesting to walk this path, but it's also very demanding. It's demanding in a sense of, you have to readjust yourself in terms of living with this uh, world of impermanence, of not-self, of suffering, you know, as the Buddha described it. 
Uh, another word which I like about suffering, because suffering can be so misunderstood, is the idea of stress. Argent Anisaro, a well-known American teacher, used the word stress for dukkha. And I quite like the word stress, because it, it's so kind of, in a way, tuned in, attuned to the modern world, that what we are living is really dukkha and stress. And so, um, yeah, so we have to dance in a way, I mean, adapt to the fact that we, 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 we are told about this quality, we realize little by little those characteristics in ourselves, you know, by through the meditation, through the practice, through the daily life, you know, somebody is a friend one day, and they, you know, the next day they don't like you, <laughs> so it's already impermanent, you know, it doesn't wait, you don't have to wait for too long, you know, you had a nice conversation with somebody, and then maybe uh, a few days later you think they are really stupid, you know, <laughs> if you're like my mind. <laughs> and then oh, all kind of things can change very, very quickly. You can't, don't, you know, you begin to realize you, you are kind of uh, move, um, sort of moving sound, you know. You're not really on the, on, the, on the world, you're not standing on something that is not, that is um, static, you know. So <clears throat> to be able to, you know, to have that kind of, uh, you need some kind of solidity to be able to uh, look at this world as this new perspective on the world, and then your experience, the personal experience of your the world that you've lived with from, from birth. And the, 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 the part of this path that really brings you down to earth very clearly is uh, just, just recognize, recognizing that we, what makes us suffer more than anything else is that we, are, we get attached to things. And it's so natural, you know, we, we like something, we immediately feel like we want to be more with what that thing is, whatever it is, you know, or, um, you know, we attach to things that we like, and then there's another kind of attachment is not wanting things you don't like. You attach to not wanting what you really dislike. Now these words are very simple, but it's not the words that matters. We're not here to learn the words. We're here to actually explore, investigate, and know for ourselves what that means. That's why it's a lifetime work. It's not just you know a few days of a few weeks like I thought when I started. I said I did a week with Achen Sumedo. I felt completely transformed. Three months, I'll be transformed for life, and I can leave the monastery and continue my life. Of course, after three months, I realized I was just a kind of uh, I don't know how would you say uh, like the the, the 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 head of a pen, you know of my life, it was just uh, nothing more than that, just a tiny, tiny nothing. And it was obvious that it's a, it's a, if you're interested in this past, it's a lifetime realization, you know. So this lifetime of realization requires a huge amount of patience, you know, a huge amount of patience. And I absolutely love the Buddha and love this teaching because it resonates so well with me. Uh, you know, with me, with not me, but never mind that, <laughs> with this character. And one, one thing that resonates is what he said, and I'm going to tell you in a minute. When I came to the monastery, the first time I came to the monastery, I remember I had another little kind of sentence coming to me, uh, which seems to be real. I said, if by the end of my life, I can be more patient than I am now, I would have been a great success for my life. And I had no idea about, you know, why did I use patience? And so, if I can be more patient than I am, because I wasn't patient at all. I was very impatient and very kind of energetic and very constantly speeding into things, you know. 
So if I can be more patient, that will be a great achievement for me. And you know what? Later on, when I read some of the suttas uh, in the Ovada Patimoka, the first teaching of the of the um, you know the discipline of the precept and the discipline for the monks and the bhikkhu and the bhikkhunis. Um, I mean, actually, the bhikkhu, because the bhikkhunis didn't exist yet. They, they were not there yet. But for the monks, um, you know, patience in this Ovada Pitimoka is like four stanza. And it's, the first line is, patience, endurance are the highest austerities. That struck me so much because tapas is a word that's used in Pali. And tapas means discipline and austerity. Now, you know how patience means nothing much in our Western world, don't you? It doesn't mean anything. Being patient, so what? You know, you, do, you want to be a genius, you know, at least intellectually or physically or something. You know, I mean, if you're ambitious, like many people are, you, know, you want to be somebody smart, you know. But patient, so what kind of thing? But then, as you practice, you realize this quality of patience is absolutely... To, it's the only thing that works truly. Do you understand? If you didn't have patience, you will leave the next day. You will leave 10 years later. Or I'm not saying the people who left didn't have any patience. Don't get me wrong. But for me, I'm just talking for me personally. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't have stayed here for more than two weeks, probably. Not just here, the first monastery where I was. I had to learn patience straight away because things were so much <laughs> different from what I wanted. People were different from the, what I wanted. Many things were kind of going against what I was used to like or what I, I was used to get rid of when I didn't like them. So, you know, uh, the, the idea of being patient was like, yes, I know why I want to be patient in a way, and consciously, it's because you know something in you want to carry on this path. It doesn't want to give it up. It doesn't want to abandon it, you know. But if you didn't have patience, you, you couldn't tolerate all the challenges that this life of no, um, you know, when I started, there's certainly no comfort. It's very comfortable now. But life of no comfort, of no security. We had no, never any idea who would come from London to give us some food, even though it always happened. Always had a, I never had a, a day without a meal, consciously. I mean, did fast, many of us were fasting, but um, you didn't, you, you, you know, we always, well, we were always generously provided by the kindness of Thai people, Western people, all kinds of people. So many things. And patience, just to go back to patience, patience for me became very clearly the feeling that goes together with mindfulness. Right? To be mindful, you have to be patient. And, <laughs> and to be patient, you have to be mindful. They go together, do you understand? They work together. And so this mindfulness, um, you know, Ajahn Sumedhu did not talk so much about consciousness is not in those days. Uh, at the, right at the beginning, he was talking about mindfulness, awareness, and so on. And that was very... Um, you, you know, now it's something that's much more part of myself, but not that I'm not mindless <laughs> quite often, but it's more very much part of my life. It's a natural element of my life. But at the beginning, it was quite hard to remember to be mindful and present and be here and now. It didn't come straight away. It was, you know, you needed a lot of, um, you know, a lot of will, a lot of remembering, a lot of sometimes beating yourself up, you know, reminding like a, hitting a little child, you know, come on, wake up, remember. Don't forget. So at first, uh, you, you have that kind of attitude. You know, you, you're training yourself. 
not with a lot of patience. <laughs> you, you kind of, you should, be do, you should be able to do it now. You should be really, why are you so stupid that you keep repeating the same old mistake again and again? You know, stay in forgiving, forgetting, and so on. And then little by little, you know, you begin to see that um, through the practice, you are uh, integrating this quality of consciousness in such a way that it becomes very much an aspect of your life which is essential, and you wonder why you didn't notice that before. Because when you are really conscious and, uh, you know, aware, then um, there is a quality of your life that is dr dramatically different. What you never saw before, suddenly you can see it. What you never investigated because you never noticed them, you begin to see, ask yourself question, you know, what is this? Why do I feel like this? Why do I think like this? Why do people, some people you can't stand, some people you like? Why do you have grudges with people and not, and other people you love them to bits straight away? You know, suddenly it brings you into, um, a, a, you know, a, a, the energy of looking at things deeply. So it's really um, a very um, interesting journey because it's truly a a, a very wonderful exploration of your life. It's like your life is well taken care of. Besides the fact you have the precepts and so on, you know, the ethical aspect, which is also a great caring program for yourself, for your life, and and all your friends around you. <laughs> they, they do, they certainly benefit from somebody who is uh, learning how to be kinder, how to be more generous, how to be more, um, you know, um, skilled in um, being, a for, in forgiving people, in, you know, forgiving yourself and so on. So basically in living in a world of peace more naturally. So I'm coming to the end of my, I don't know what time I started, but it's coming to the end, isn't it, Ajahn Maru, more or less? Started at quarter two, is that it? Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'm training myself, seriously, I'm not kidding. Um, okay, I'll give you a few more minutes. <laughs> One thing I can share with you is that I'm going to be really sad this year not to have Achen Sumido with us for his birthday on the 27th of July. <laughs> Came up in my meditation a few times. I'd like to leave you, leave you with one little sentence. Never believe your mind. Now, it's a simple sentence, but I have experienced this so hundreds of millions of times that I really um, like to let people know. Never believe your mind, because it's always capable to do things you never know. Truly. So, on those words, I leave you.